I'm so glad you're here. Be awful to stand up and do a talk with an empty sanctuary, but then God would be present, so it really wouldn't be empty. And thank you, Robert. I'm glad you wore a suit today. <laughs> when I begin, I want to talk a little bit about Unity Seminary. It's different than almost any other school that I'm aware of. There are two curriculums. One is the academic, the books, the lessons, the teachers. The other is not written anywhere. It's something that happens automatically. It's the spiritual curriculum. At Unity Village, and I always call it the village because that's what we called it when I was in school. At Unity Village, when you go there, there's a different feeling, a feeling of peace and love and truth. And I'm not talking about truth against lies. I'm talking about something greater than that. There's facts in life and we usually live by the facts. Before Columbus discovered that the world was round, it was called flat. That was a fact. But then, facts change. The truth is, the world is round. So we often confuse the facts with the truth. And the truth is that there's only one presence and one power in all the universe, and that's God. And God lives in us as the Christ. Going through seminary is very emotional for some of us because we change. What we're learning, the truth that we're learning, bumps up against all of our old knowings. And I don't call them beliefs, I call them knowings because those are the things that we know absolutely are true. And uh, I say that because also, we don't believe our name, we know it. And so that's what I'm talking about, what we know absolutely to be true. And some of those things are true, and some, most of them are not. They're what we've been taught through life. We're only human. We have to be right. You can't be wrong. You have to be good. You can't be bad. And the truth is, most things are not right or wrong, bad or good. They only are come to the point of isness. When we come to the point of isness and recognize something that's going on, we can say, what is this about for me? What can I do about this? Are there options? And so we are open up to other things when we uh, come to the point of isness. So I'm in seminary. Uh, I was in my second year in January, and I had been going through, oh God, emotion, emotional stuff that I hope I never have to experience again, and I hope I got it all out. I know I did, God. Um, but one on, in January of that second year, I was in the bookstore, I managed the bookstore, and I was in the bookstore, student bookstore, and something happened, and I totally fell apart. I was crying, sobbing, couldn't get myself together. So I decided to go out into the Rose Garden. Now, the Rose Garden in June is beautiful. It is absolutely gorgeous. The, roses, uh, the uh, Rose Garden is very large. It has walkways through it and benches where you can sit. This day in January was very cold. I forgot my coat. It was very cold. Um, there was dirty snow on the ground and it was that dank kind of cold. And I went down and I found a seat and I sat there and cried and cried and cried until I was done crying. And I looked at this rose bush. It looked like a thorny stem dead stick. And I thought, that's what I feel like, a thorny stem dead stick. 
And then as I looked at the rose, rose bush that was all pruned, looked like a thorny stem dead stick, I began to wonder where the rose was. Where was the rose in the rose bush that looked so beautiful in June? So where is the rose? You know, you can chop, chop the rose bush open. You can slice it. You can dice it. You can dig around in the roots. You can dig around in the dirt, and you won't find a rose in January. Where is it? The rose is in the rose bush as potential. And in order for it to grow, it has to be nourished. It needs sunshine. It needs rain. It needs healthy soil. It needs to be tended and cared for so that the bloom is big. So where is the rose? It's in the rose bush as potential. It doesn't make any difference what you do to it. Um, you know that it's going to be a rose bush. It can't be anything else. You can't change it. It's going to be a rose. And then I thought some more, and I thought, the Christ is in us as the rose is in the robush, uh, rose bush. The Christ is in us as the rose is in the rose bush. It's in us as potential. Now, the rose bush knows how to be a rose. It has everything in it to create the rose. And we have everything in us that will create the expression of Christ in us and in our lives but it needs tending. It needs tending. So how do we tend it? Well, the rose bush has to have soil that is nutrient and healthy. And actually, our spirit, our Christ, needs soil. It needs uh, clear soil with nutrients. It doesn't need any stones or rocks. But in our garden, as we plant our rose bush, there are lumps and clumps of dirt and stones, and all of these impede its growth. So our first ta task is to make the soil arable. And so we begin to break up the clumps, and we begin, begin to take out the stones. The stones uh, are those things that we hold in mind that we know absolutely are true whether they're true or not. And the clumps are those uh, things that aren't so solid that we can let go of. If we lived in any other country, say in uh, uh, the Middle East, we would believe exactly the same thing that they believe. Is that better than us? It's just different. It's just different. So we begin to become aware of the lumps and clumps. We don't have to do anything about it, just become aware of it. Because those things that we really believe are true are energy systems. And as we begin to become aware that they're there, they begin to lose their energy. And then the rose bush, you know, begins to start greening up the stem starts greening up. And that's the place when we're greening up is where the nourishment comes through. It is the place where we begin to think about what we're thinking about when we're not thinking about anything. Because those deep thoughts are the ones that rule us. And so as we become aware of those, then the Christ can ex uh, uh, express through us at, to a greater degree. So then we come to a little green leafness. And green leafness is about forgiveness. Our spiritual growth and tending our Christ self is dependent upon our forgiveness because unforgiveness blocks the way that it can express in our lives. Now that doesn't mean it won't, it just means it's more difficult for it to get through. 
Forgiveness is one of the most important things we can do. I, and, and it's the hardest thing to do. We forget that um, the other person doesn't feel a thing when we don't forget them, but it does horrible things to us inside. I remember when I was um, uh, in, a, in a ministry that I was new, and um, I'd been there about a month, I had a board meeting, and the next day, one of the board members came in, <clears throat> And she said, I just want to offer you some constructive criticism. Now, we all know what that is. <laughs> so she told me everything that I did wrong at the board meeting. And I said, thank you very much, and she left. A bit later, maybe a week or two, she came back in and she says, you're not doing the Sunday service right. You know, you're really inept. You really don't know what you're doing. And I said, thank you very much. So she came in again a couple of weeks later, and it got worse. It got worse. And then the next week when she came in, I lost it. I lost it. I started yelling at her and told her to go you know where, which uh, really upset her because that was something I wasn't supposed to do. Finally, she left, and I was so angry about what she said, so angry with her. How dare she? So I decided to go home. And I was driving along, and I'm thinking, you know how you do that. You're so angry. What does she think she's doing? Who does she think he is, she is? Why is this happening to me? What am I doing wrong? And that's going through my mind. And then I thought, wait a minute, Vi. Think about what you're thinking about. And I let that be there for a minute, and then as I came to a stoplight, and in that, in, uh, that, that second where you put your foot on the brake, I knew what it was about. She was saying out loud all of the things I was saying to myself that I was totally unaware of. And that's why I'm talking about thinking about what you're thinking about. And, and I had built up this horrible anger over her, but when I discovered what she was doing, the anger was forgot. The whole thing was forgiven, and I gave thanks for that experience. Now, on the other hand, I know uh, a young woman who was going through a divorce, and part of that divorce was uh, a settlement of something that was hers, absolutely hers. She loved it, she wanted it, and in the divorce, it was awarded to her husband. She was so furious, and she just said everything she possibly could against him. She held that anger for years, five, six, seven years. She couldn't let it go. She knew that her unforgiveness of this thing was harder on her than it was on him, but she couldn't let it go. One day, I have no idea what happened to her, but she came to me and she says, I finally let go. I, forgive, I forgive him. And it was miraculous what happened to her because she began to glow. She began to smile. She began to be pleasant to be around. And that's the power of forgiveness in us. Freeze up our energy. And then we move to a little budness. Just a little budness. And uh, this is where we come to the important step of nourishing our Christ self through prayer and meditation. <coughs> These are the most important things that we can do for the growth of our, our Christ. Can we have Christ in you? Uh, usually we don't think that the Bible says anything about Christ in us, but it does. It does. 
Uh, Jesus says the, the kingdom of heaven is in the midst of you. He's saying the same thing. And in Colossians, we read the mystery hidden for ages and generations, which is Christ in you. And, he, and it's written by Paul from jail. He'd been imprisoned for his uh, beliefs and his teachings. And he heard about this group that was, began to worship um, animals and goddesses, and he wanted to st set them straight. So he wrote this letter. And this is one of the things he says in it. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we get there for prayer and meditation. That's the fertilizer that uh, makes it grow, that gets our roots down in spirit so that we can express this truth of what we are. Prayer and meditation. Most of us um, pray when we think we need it. Most of us meditate in the morning and forget about it the rest of the day. One of the things that we don't do in our process is accept the truth that Christ is in us. It's not Jesus. Jesus is our way shower. We walk with Jesus. He says, the things that I do, you can do. Things that I do, you can do. And what did he do? He healed the sex, the sick. He fed the hungry. He raised the dead. And he says, these things that I do, you can do. And the thing that makes it possible, I know people who can, can heal. They are also uh, spend a lot of time in prayer. So one of the things that we don't do is we don't accept Christ in us. Have you? Sometimes I forget. But it's not a knowing like those rocks and those clumps. It isn't usually something that directs our life. Leads us on the way. So we accept that, and prayer and meditation is one of the ways that we do that. Two of the ways. Um, meditation is a wonderful thing. It, it, it uh, clears the way for you. I remember uh, years and years ago in my other life, um, I worked in a beer warehouse, a uh, beer company. And my job was to count the money with the other office girl, uh, make sure that the invoices and the money matched, made sure how much uh, beer was still on the truck. And in order to do that, we had to do a lot of adding. And we used one of those old adding machines, you know, you crank it. And I was in Unity. I was teaching Sunday school and always trying to figure out uh, what to do and, and how to help them understand. But I came to the idea by you are supposed to be the teacher here. Have you accepted Christ in you? And I, I found an affirmation. And the affirmation is there's only one presence and one power active in my mind, body, and all the affairs of my life. And when I was, I, I learned somewhere that if you put your affirmation to something that you're doing physically, you learn it faster. So I would do my adding machine and I would go, there's only one presence and one power in all the universe, the presence and power of God who is active in all my affairs. My mind, my body, and affairs. So I did that. Oh, God, I did that for a long time. And then I was in another life. And I was driving down a dark, dark road. And I was looking for this shop. And I ran out of shops to look at. And it was very, very dark. And I thought, I need to turn around. And I finally came to a 7-Eleven, and it was on the opposite side of the street. So I thought, 
okay, I'll turn around here. So I, there was a little hill in front of me, and so I looked to make sure nothing was coming, and I started to make my turn. A truck came over the hill and broadsided me. There's only one presence, one power active in my life, the presence and power of God, which is absolute good, the good un omnipotent. So I sat there, and that was the first thing that came to mind, was that affirmation. That was the very first thing, and I sat there. And the police were called. I had nothing to do that. I sat in my car, and a young man came up to the window of my car. The passenger side was the one that got hit, and said to me, you need to get out of the car. You might be hit again. And I says, I know that, but I can't get out. I just can't move. And he said, okay. And he reached in the window and he held his hand on my back. Just held his hand. And then the police started to come and he said to me, you'll be all right now. And he walked away and disappeared. I always thought that was my angel. There's only one presence and one power and, and God sent that angel. But that's not the end. The policeman had us in the car and he says to me, you're gonna get a ticket. I was crying. He says, you're gonna get a ticket. The guy had said he tried to stop. He saw me try to stop, but he couldn't stop in time. So I'm the one that's getting the ticket, right? So I'm sitting there and he, the policeman says, you're gonna get a ticket. And I said, I know, and I was crying. He says, crying isn't gonna get you out of the ticket. And I said, I know, I just need to cry. So he did what he needed to do, and then he says to me, is there someone you can call to take you home? Because I was out, God only knows where, I was new in town. And I said, I don't know anybody in town. And he thought for a minute, and he says, well, I'm not supposed to do this, but I'll take you home. And he took me home. Then I had to go to court, of course, because I have this, this ticket. And when I got to court, there was a policeman, same one. He talked to the judge, and the case was dismissed. No, fine. There's only one presence and one power, quickened and active, in my mind, body, and all the affairs of my life the presence and power of God, the good, omnipotent. It's good to have an affirmation handy that we can use when we're in times of trouble. Most of us forget that. But if we can get that, so it's as hard, not hard, but it's as energetic as the energy in those rocks, just think, what it'll do for us. Just think how many angels will come into your life. Just think about how you will be guided into those things. And when you're in a mess, you'll be guided through that. Every mess that comes along usually has a lesson for us, like the woman that came into my office. And so as we begin to think about what we think about, we can change those and let go of those things that we believe are true that aren't. We can begin to think about what we're thinking about when we're not thinking about anything. We can forgive. That's the most important thing we can do. You know, I don't know, how, truth, how do I say this? We find the idea of forgiveness in a lot of different places because it's so powerful when we forgive. It's like something falls away from us. So forgiveness is really, really an important thing. And if we can't forgive, we forgive and forgive until we've forgiven. It's not right or wrong, it's not bad or good. So anyway, it's a good idea to have an affirmation handy that we can use when the stuff hits the fan so that we draw to us that will help us through it. And as we begin to follow these steps, we begin to express Christ in us. Maybe not fully at first, but we've made room for it. See, most of us don't have room for it. 
We haven't made room for it. So this gives us room for it, more and more room for it. And so then we become that full expression of the Christ. This hasn't taken as long as I thought it would. So I want to finish this with, with this. I behold the Christ in you. Here the life of God I see. I can see you whole and free. I behold the Christ in you. I can see this as you walk. I see this in all you do. I can see it as you talk. I behold the Christ in you. God's love expressed in you. I can see you filled with power. I can see you ever blessed. I see Christ in you, hour by hour. I behold the Christ in you. I can see that perfect one, led by God in all you do. I can see God's work is done. And that's the truth. <laughs>